time and a pleasant day. Oh, the John Harbour I was faring as a cabin boy on a sailing lugger. For to go and hunt the shores of Herring. Hello, my name's Polly and I work for the school's learning team here at Time and Tide Museum. Now, in normal times, this courtyard behind me would be full of children learning about their local area in Roman times, what it was like when the Vikings were here, how did World War II affect us, even as far back as East Anglia in the Stone Age. But of course, we're not in normal times. So I thought today, maybe you guys would like a taster of what it's like to visit Time and Tide on a school trip. Now, one of our most popular events, because of its significance locally, is of course fishing. So, I hope you're ready, hold on tight, because we are going back in time. Oh! Well, you'd better come inside. So, why is fishing so important to Great Yarmouth? I mean, so important that on our coat of arms, the lions have the tails of herring. Well, first off, Yarmouth is only here because of fishing. Believe it or not, the land that Great Yarmouth is built on has not always been here. Probably until around 5600 BC, Norfolk was joined to Europe by a land bridge known as Doggerland, and animals such as mammoth, bears and deer roamed on this tundra plain. By Roman times, the area had flooded and the mouth of the air was known as the Great Estuary was protected on each side by Caister and Borough Castle forts. Yarmouth didn't even exist, it was under the sea. Gradually, over time, a sandbank began to build up in the mouth of this estuary, and this is where we see the first people begin to settle, on this narrow spit of land that is to become Great Yarmouth. These early settlers were not holiday makers looking for some fun on the snails, but fishermen who followed the herring. They would put up temporary shelters for the fishing season and use the sandbank for drying and repairing nets. It was around AD 1008 that the first permanent houses were built in Yarmouth on Fuller's Hill. At this time, this was the only dry land in the area. At six metres above sea level, it's the highest point in the town. Great Yarmouth is recorded in the Doomsday Survey of 1086 as being a fishing and mercantile community of 70 people. At this point, herring was being used as a currency in lieu of a cash payment to the king or lord of the manor. So the herring is king. So for those of you who might wonder what a herring looks like, here we are. Now herrings are migratory fish. They start their life right up in the north of Scotland and gradually over the year they work their way down the east side of the country until they arrive in the sea off the coast of Great Yarmouth around October time. Now in Great Yarmouth we call them our silver darlings. Can you see why? Yes, now he does have a very silver tummy but his back is black. And this is the fish's camouflage. You see herring come up to the surface of the sea at night to find their food. So his silver tummy means that anything swimming around down there, looking up for a tasty snack, can't see the herring because all he can see is the silver of the moonlight shining through the surface of the water. And anything that's flying around up there looking down for a tasty snack, can't see the herring because his black back blends in beautifully with the dark surface of the sea at night. Clever, huh? Unfortunately, he's not quite clever enough not to get caught in our fishermen's nets. So I wonder if you have what it takes to do a job in the fishing industry. Let's start with the fishermen themselves. First of all, you're going to need the right clothing. Remember that herring are here in the winter. And this is the North Sea in winter. And of course, the best time to catch them is at night because that's when herring are near the surface looking for their food. So warm jumpers, oilskin coats and hats and tall boots are what you're going to need. And of course, 
big socks. These will be lovingly knitted for you, along with a nice warm jumper called a Gamzee. This Gamzee from our collection was knitted for Norfolk fisherman Jimmy Paris West by his mother. He was stationed in Scotland during World War I and the local women could hardly believe it was handmade as it was so finely knitted. It was really important for Gamzees to have an extremely fine knit for warmth but the pattern is also important. You can see the bottom half is plain but the top half has a pattern that was unique to families and this is for a very important reason. Now fishing was and still is a very dangerous job. You're out on a small boat in the middle of the North Sea in the winter. But one thing fishermen never wore is one of these. They didn't wear life jackets and they also didn't learn how to swim. They figure that if you go overboard you're going to drown anyway so you might as well make it quick. Now if the worst should happen and you go overboard then I'm afraid you might not be washed up on the beach for quite some time. It might be quite difficult to work out who you are when we find the body. But if you're wearing your Gansey, at least we'll be able to tell from the pattern on your Gansey who you are and give you a decent burial. Probably because they were doing such a dangerous job, fishermen were very superstitious. Doing the washing on a Monday is very bad luck. Fishermen's wives believe that by doing so, their husband might be washed away. Some fishermen believed that if the first fish to be caught was male, the haul would be disappointing. It was also considered a good idea to throw the first fish back into the sea to encourage a good catch. It's never a good idea to whistle a happy tune whilst working at sea. It will definitely result in a storm. It was considered bad luck to meet clergymen or women in white aprons on the way to the harbour. Some fishermen also avoided encounters with red-haired people, people with flat feet and worst of all, four-legged beasts. Anyway, we've got sidetracked. We're supposed to be making sure you've got what you need to go fishing. So your Gansey will keep you warm, as long as you don't go overboard, but you need oil skins to keep you dry, as demonstrated here by my glamorous assistant. Now you have a lovely big oil skin coat with the buttons hidden away so that you don't get tangled in your own fishing net. You can see your sou'wester has a very unique shape. It goes down to a point at the back here. And that's so that the water runs down your back rather than down the back of your neck. So let's test it out. So you've got the gear, but have you actually got what it takes to be a fisherman? You're going to need some muscles to haul in those nets full of fish. And do you know how to actually catch a fish? Well, first of all, you're going to need a net because you want to catch a lot of fish all at once. The Lydia Eva, on one day in 1937, held a record catch of 220,000 fish fish. That's a lot of herring. So here is a small portion of fishing net. The nets could actually be over a mile long and would hang as deep as one of the sides of the town hall in Great Yarmouth. The line of corks that you can see along the top of the net there is called the float line and that floats on the surface of the sea. The rest of the net hangs straight down in the water like a tennis net. So how do you catch a fish? Well, the herring comes swimming along, minding his own business, looking for his dinner. But he can't really see the net in the dark water. And so he's going to swim straight into it. 
And then he's going to panic because he thinks he's stuck, which means that he's going to breathe very quickly. His gills will open and close, open and close, and get tangled in the net until he's so tangled that he can't get out. And that's how you catch a fish. Now, if you're not sure about your sea legs, don't worry, because there are plenty of jobs that can be done right here on land for both men and women. Yes, sorry girls, you can't go fishing. It's very, very bad luck to have a girl on your boat. But there are jobs for you on land. It's said that for every man employed at sea, there were a hundred men and women employed on land. So let's start right here, because Time and Tide Museum is housed in an old smokehouse, the Tower Curing Works. This was built in 1850 and didn't close until 1988. At one point, there were more than 60 smokehouses in Galston and Great Yarmouth. Those of you who've been to the museum will know that the smell is still very strong. It's in the very fabric of the building. This room is one of seven original smokestacks. Basically what it is, is a giant chimney. Charlie here is a climber and it's his job to climb to the top and hang the herring up. Now girls, I know I did promise you jobs, but I'm afraid this isn't one you can do because you can't go up there in a skirt. But there would be competitions between the different stacks to see who could fill theirs the quickest and no health and safety rules. Each stack could hold 24,000 herring. So to do this job, you're going to need long legs and a good head for heights. Now I know I did promise you jobs, girls, and here's one for you. This is Maisie, and she loads the fish onto the speeds and passes them up to the climbers. Now there is more than one way to smoke a herring. Everybody loves a kipper. To smoke kippers, you need one of these. It's called a bulk. And what you need to do is cut your herring open along his backbone, open him up flat, pull out all of his insides, and then he's hung on here. Can you see it has pairs of metal hooks all the way down? And that's so that you can hang the fish up by his eyes. <laughs> Lovely. But it means you don't damage the flesh of the fish that you want to eat. Now, in Great Yarmouth, we are famous for our floaters. Even our football team is nicknamed after a bloater. Now, to smoke a bloater, you keep the fish whole with all of his guts left inside and you need a stick like this called a speed. And what you do is you find the gills on your fish, you push the end of the speed into his gills and out through his mouth. There we are, lovely. Now you need to do that quite quickly to keep up with those climbers. You want about 20 on this speed, like the ones behind me. When we got into the street, which was strange enough to me, and smelt the fish and pitch and oakum and tar, and saw the sailors walking about and the carts jangling up and down over the stones, I felt I had done so busy a place an injustice, and said as much to Peggotty, who heard my expressions of delight with great complacency, and told me it was well known, I suppose to those who had the good fortune to be born bloaters, that Yarmouth was upon the whole, the finest place in the universe. But what about my job? Well, I'm one of the army of fisher girls. We work out here on the quayside in teams of three, gutting and packing the fish into barrels of salt like this. Like the fisher men, many of the fisher girls were Scottish. They would follow the herring. During the herring season in Great Yarmouth, there could be over 6,000 Scots girls in the town. And no matter their age, they were always called girls. It's a hard life. It's cold. We work outside in the middle of winter. We work long hours from first thing in the morning until last thing at night but we keep our spirits up by chatting and singing, and if we get a spare moment, we do lots of knitting. The herring is the king of the sea, the herring is the fish for me, the herring is the king of the sea. Sing, sing, fa, la, 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 la. 
us fisher girls work pretty fast because you get paid by the barrel load. So it's in your interest to be as quick as you can. Some fisher girls can gut 60 fish in one minute. That's one every second. Now, do you think I can gut a fish that quickly? Well, shall we see? This is the kind of knife the fisher girls would have used. As you can see, it has a wooden handle and a very short, very sharp blade. Now the fisher girls technique is to put their knife and their finger into the fish at the same time and in one movement gut the fish. But I'm going to do it this way round because I don't want to lose my fingers. I need to put the knife in this little hole here, that's the fish's bottom, and slice up his tummy and pull out all his guts. Shall we see if I can do it in one second? Well two seconds is not bad, I'm happy with that, that's pretty much a record for me. Yeah, okay, you're right, I did cheat, just a little bit. Perhaps we should see it properly. Now, of course, this is the best bit of every school trip, the guts, mmm, lovely. And we have here a male fish, we can tell by his creamy pink coloured row here, that this is a male fish, and this we can fry up and eat later on, delicious. And you can see from that just how fast those fisher girls were. I mean, if you were watching them, their hands were literally a blur. They were working so quickly. And a favourite fact that I always like to leave children with when they're wondering whether they've got what it takes to do this job is this. You see, my hand is now completely covered with the scales of the herring. You just see those there. And uh, the worst, one of the worst injuries for a fisher girl is you know you're working hard you might mop your brow and it would be quite easy to get one of those fish scales in your eye uh, and if that happens well there's really only one way that you can get a fish scale out of your eye and that's with your tongue uh, but of course you can't do that for yourself can you N no so you need one of your uh, fellow workers to do that for you so you've got to be quite good friends really hmm that often puts lots of children off <laughs> more than the guts. It was a fine and a pleasant day Out of Yarmouth Harbour I was faring As a cabin boy on a sailing lugger for to go and hunt the shoals of herring Oh, the work was hard and the hours were long And the treatment sure it took some bearing There was a little kindness and the kicks were many As we hunted for the shoals of herring In the stormy seas and the living girls just to earn your daily bread or your daring and from Yarmouth Harbour to the Faroe Islands as you're following 